Um, well, welcome to this talk on Go, and uh, it's how to get started with the Go programming language. My name's Todd McLeod, and I've had the honor and the privilege to uh, teach Go at both the college and the university level. And so I started teaching at the university as adjunct faculty in 1997 in business. My academic training is economics and uh, business. And then I got a full-time job in 2000 to teach accounting at the community college and uh, did that for a year. And then that was right after the dot-com boom and there was a lack of programmers in the world, <laughs> including academia. And so they said, do you want to teach programming? Because I was good with computers. So in 2001, I started teaching web dev. Did that till 2005 and then got back into it in 2013. And I went to my colleague and I said, you know, hey, are people still using Dreamweaver? And she just laughed <laughs> in 2013. And, uh, and so then I asked, uh, you know, one of my former students, what language should I learn now? And because uh, he was at, the, uh, he'd become an engineer at Nike and he's now an engineer at Amazon. And he said, you should really check out Go. And so when I took a look at Go, it really grabbed my interest. And as soon as, as soon as I learned what I'm going to share with you, as soon as I learned that, I was like, I absolutely have to learn this language. I was just completely compelled uh, to, to get into it. And I was one of the first, if not the first, university professor in America to teach Go at the university level. And so that, that was a, a super great blessing. Um, that said, my background's econ and business, and I'm kind of a self-taught coder. And, uh, and I teach graduate students in computer science <laughs> how to, at times, how to do coding. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I am here for you. This is your hour. And so just, you know, I have things I could definitely share with you. And some of the things I want to share is a project I built in Go, some resources for learning Go, uh, and why Go. So I'm definitely going to share a little bit about why Go. And, uh, and then also, uh, I deal a lot at the interface Venn diagram overlap between computer science and business. In academia, IS, IT, that's my actual department at the college. Um, but uh, also, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that overlap uh, and ideas for applications. But first and foremost, I'm here for you. So does anybody have anything right off the bat that they feel like they really need to have this question answered? Or should I just go? <laughs> so if, uh, if at any point I'm a big believer in dialogue and community of the crowd, and I'm not a believer in sage on the stage, I'm a believer in collaborative uh, everything. And, um, and so if at any point you feel a question, uh, the only dumb questions are the ones that go on at, are unasked, okay? So we're all we are all always operating on the edge of not knowing, and, uh, and we all have things we know, and there's a tremendous amount we don't know. Physicists tell us that 96% of the universe is dark matter, and we don't know what it is. <laughs> so the vast majority of stuff we don't know anything about. So the only dumb questions are the ones that go unasked. So I believe in collaboration. If you feel a pressing question, I really encourage you uh, if you feel like it'd be a, a great contribution or it needs to be asked, to please ask it. Uh, so the first resource I'll give you is uh, github.com goes to 11. And uh, I'll just make this larger for a second. So if you want to snap a picture of it. And so as I talk, as we grab, uh, you know, as we, um, you know, go over different resources and things like that, because the main point for this talk is to, one, kind of tell you what compelled me to go. And then, two, give you the resources so that when you leave here, if you're interested, and learning more about the language, you know uh, how to go about doing that, and you've got some resources to, to use for that. And, you know, we could see some of the language, too, but that's secondary to, uh, you know, preparing you to be out there in the world on your own and do some more learning. All right, uh, so the first thing that compa compelled me about Go was, in, and why Go was created, uh, you know, so uh, the first thing was that Google... Uh, in 2005, 2006, looked around at all of the programming languages, and you know, I'm not an insider, so this is hearsay, uh, and my own formulation from what I've heard from various sources. But they looked around at all the programming languages in the world, and they said none of them are meeting our needs. And so for me, that is a tremendous statement, because Google, to me, is one of the world's leading software engineering firms and one of the greatest software engineering firms that's ever existed in the, human, in the history of humanity. 
And they looked around at all the coding languages that exist, and they say none of them are meeting our needs. And in particular, they wanted three things. They wanted ease of programming. Ease of programming. Make it easy, right? Like, it's got to write easy. I don't want stuttering. I don't want redundance. I don't want redundancy. I don't want complexity. I want the clarity of like a Zen Buddhist priest. It's just crystal clear. Right? So ease of programming, that was the first thing they're looking for. Something that could write like a scripting language, like Python, ease of programming style. Second thing they wanted was uh, uh, ease, ease, of, uh, ease of programming, and they wanted efficient execution. So it had to be highly performant. So ease of programming, efficient execution, and, uh, and then also efficient compilation. So they don't want to have to sit around for 40 minutes and wait for a bill, change something, and then sit around for another 40 minutes to see if that improved it. And so they wanted those three deals. And this came at a time in the evolution of uh, hardware where we went from single core commercially available machines to dual core commercially available machines. So the first you know, multi-core, uh, dual core commercially available machines came about in 2005 or 2006. And, um, and at that time, there were no languages that had been built to natively take advantage of multiple cores. So there were languages which could, could, could do concurrency design patterns and parallel execution. And so sometimes there's confusion about concurrency versus parallelism. And concurrency is a design pattern. You could write your code to be concurrent. Right? That's a design pattern. You design your code that way, and then you go run your code. And if you take your concurrent code and you run it on a machine with a single core, it's not going to run parallel. <laughs> right? There's one thread going through that single core. And, uh, and then, you know, if you have multiple cores, though, your concurrent design pattern code could then run in parallel on multiple cores. So that's concurrency versus parallelism. And in 2005, 2006, there wasn't a language that was natively built to take advantage of that. Uh, and, um, and some languages did have that ability, but it was really challenging and difficult to do it in those languages. And so they said they wanted ease of execution, well, they wanted ease of programming, efficient execution, and efficient compilation, and to natively take advantage of multiple cores. And so to build this language, they tasked three gentlemen to lead up the charge. Uh, uh, the, the head of the charge was Rob Pike, and then also Ken Thompson, and then also Robert Gressimer. And so uh, I think I have a picture of them here and right there. And so my, my take on this is Go is invented by geniuses. And Ken Thompson uh, helped create B, C, Unix, UTF-8. Rob Pike helped create Unix and UTF-8. Ken and Rob were, you know, instrumental on UTF-8. And uh, Robert Gressimer, also a heavy hitter. And uh, these individuals, like Unix, C, <laughs> UTF-8, this is kind of like the bedrock of computer science. And so uh, I call these individuals luminaries in computer science. And the fact that Google's creating a new language and that it's being created by these individuals and that they're guaranteeing backwards compatibility. So Go was released version 1, uh, March of 2012 and guaranteed backwards compatibility. And so it's an open source project, but you know, it's backed by the powerhouse, which is Google and these individuals. And so when I heard that, I was like, all right, I'm going to learn Go and start teaching that. And I first presented on Go here at Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley Code Camp in 2015. So that's a little bit about uh, the history of Go. and. Uh, the next thing I'll do, anybody have any questions about all that? Or, you know, it's uh, statically typed is also important to know. And it's got a garbage collector, but it's super optimized and an amazing feat of engineering. Um, so it's super quick. And, uh, yeah, any, any other questions about it any, uh, to what I've covered so far? It's good? Okay. Um, the next thing I'll do is I'll just give you some resources for learning Go. And so uh, my teacher was Bill Kennedy, and, uh, and he has a company called Arden Labs. And so Arden Labs used to do private, uh, a lot of private or public courses that you could just sign up. They'd be in San Francisco or other large cities. Uh, but now they're primarily corporate training. Occasionally they still have public courses and also courses sometimes offered for free. And, uh, and so Bill Kennedy is one of the great teachers 
and in the Go programming language and one of the great influencers. So if uh, you need, watch for his courses, watch for when he's coming to town and follow him on Twitter if you're into the Go programming language. Uh, the next one that I'll recommend is John Calhoun. And John Calhoun is a, a friend of mine now. We've become friends. And so he has uh, something called Gopher Sizes. And I guess, you know, we could just do John Calhoun Twitter. And then we'll also look for Gopher Sizes. And uh, we'll bring that up. Gopher Sizes. So he has this website here, which this part is free. And then, of course, uh, he gets your email address and... Once uh, you, he has paid courses, which you could also take. So those are great. And then I also have some uh, courses on Udemy, uh, in addition to a platform which we built with Go. And so you could take a look at my courses there. And, uh, and then they're also here on Greater Commons. And so it's uh, no different for me if you take them on one place or the other. And Greater Commons is um, like it was a passion project because I've been in education all of my life. And I first had the idea for it in 2005, but things happen in life and you can't get everything done that you want. So I was happy to finally see that to fruition. But one of the things in terms of business is I don't know what to do with this right now, right? So if anybody has any ideas, and currently I'm talking to one company that does, uh, this could fit into their portfolio. But we're looking for a home for that. So if anybody has any ideas on. And also, I'll just mention, because it's another thing I'm working on, and I've received uh, some recognition from it at a pretty high level uh, from one of America's leading private foundations. But I have ideas for how education should look in the future. And, uh, and it doesn't exist right now. And so um, if anybody, is, and I live in Fresno, so I'm not quite sure like how to make that happen in terms of finding funding. And you know, that's not my area of expertise, nor do I have a lot of time. But if anybody is, if that falls into your wheelhouse, I think that I have three provisional patents on it. And uh, I think that that idea has um, a lot of uh, potential. So if anybody wants to talk to me about that offline, like if you have done stuff and been in the, like this is how you get investors and this is how you start taking a, a company or an idea forward or hey, I'd be interested in hearing your ideas because I work with investors, uh, definitely talk with me because that's not my wheelhouse. But I think this idea has a you know, large uncrowded path of potential. Um, so uh, let, me, let me know about that. Um, so those are uh, resources for Learning Go. The last one that I'll add, anybody have any questions about that? Because that's kind of like a mystery little, you know, uh, thing. I, or it's kind of like, um, you know, uh, how would you say it? It's, um, it's uh, ambiguous. So if anybody has any questions about that, I'm totally fine to uh, answer that. Anybody questions about that? No, we're good. So the Go Time podcast is also a good resource. And uh, John Calhoun and Johnny Borsquat, still not totally sure how to say his name, uh, are often on there, and they're great. Okay, um, so those are the resources, and uh, I don't know, what, what else would you like to see next? We've used up 15 minutes, so we've got like, what, 30, 35 left? You want to see a little bit about the language and what it looks like and how to code it? You like seeing code? Enough talking, more coding? <laughs> Um, so, uh, sure, let's do that. So, I'm going to create, um, I'll start off actually with just a, a file. And so, main.go is, uh, you know, this file could be called anything, but package main is going to be the entry package for your program, and go is built by packages, and, uh, you know, it's one of the ways to organize your code is just put it in different packages. And then you have func main, which is the entry point for all of your programs. So your program is going to begin at the top of func main and end when you leave func main. And, uh, and then inside here, you could, you know, start uh, doing things. So func print line allows me to, you know, print to standard out. And uh, Go is really based upon types. Like when I first started learning Go, Bill Kennedy was like, it's all about type. It's about type. It's all about types. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but it's all about types. And as you work with the language, eventually you'll be like, oh, it's all about types. 
And so it has a kind of like a new evolution iteration in how to approach programming. And if you look at the history of programming from spaghetti code to modularizing code and object-oriented programming, um, you know, it's an interesting next step in the evolution of, of uh, programming. And so the official website of the Go uh, project is golang.org. And I'll just drop that in there too because that's good to know about. And I'm just going to keep these in order that I talk about them. And, um, <clears throat> and so in here you could go to documents. And the two most important documents for you to know about in golang.org is uh, the Golang spec and then also effective, I call it effective Golang, effective Go. And, um, and so when you look for those, you have the language specification. And this language specification, when you approach this document, know that this was written by the high, high priest masters. And uh, you know, I know somebody who was a coder for 20 years and it took him six months before he fully understood this document. He's like, I just kept reading it and reading it and reading it. So that's the language uh, specification. And then there's also effective Go right here. And so that's the, you know, a little bit more like, okay, so here's how you use what we talked about in the language specification, a little bit more. So sometimes if it's not explained well in one place, you can look to the other, other place. And then uh, and also in here you have your, um, your packages. And you could get there by just going to packages. And so this is the standard library. And uh, I could also get there you know, by package documentation. So both those links take me to the same place. And so package documentation or packages, I'm just going to click on packages. And so this is the standard library. And it's a very robust standard library, very robust standard library. And so um, you know, just to kind of illustrate that, I'll share some of the outlines for courses that we've recently been building. And you could find these courses of mine either on Greater Commons or on Udemy. And so here's uh, Web Architecture Fundamentals with Go. And uh, I'm not sure why I'm not getting a click on that. Let me refresh. There we go. And uh, here's Collaboration and Crawling. And, um, and then, uh, and so right now we're just finishing recording a course, Web Authentication, Encryption, JWT, and OAuth. And, you know, doing HMAC and SS, uh, uh, and SHA, right, to uh, authenticate and store that in a cookie or local storage, or then building JWT in front of that, or putting, putting that into JWT, and doing OAuth too. Like, this is stuff, like all of that stuff is all natively available in the standard library. This is a third-party package for OAuth too. Um, but really well supported by the community. Go's got a really great community, very friendly, very approachable. And uh, Golang Forum, uh, Forum, Golang Bridge Forum is a great place to also know about. Um, uh, because, you know, if you have questions or, yeah, this is just like basically the best place to ask questions. And so I'll drop that in there too. I guess I said order that things are coming up. And uh, great for questions and connecting with other gophers, people who code. Go are known as gophers. And, um, and I'll give you my own speculation as to uh, part of the reason maybe why it became the Go programming languages, because one of the syntactic elements that we use is um, we could create a variable. And so I could do f name. And uh, Go uh, trends towards simplicity. So built into the language is this idea that uh, you know, the narrower the scope of a variable, the shorter the variable name should be. But you want your code to be clean and readable. So if you need to include a longer name for readability, include it. Because you want any developer to be able to walk in and look at your code and quickly understand and see, see similar formatting and, and, you know, naming conventions and things between all codes so that as you're working on a lar large team, one person's code doesn't look drastically different from another person's code. So you're able to more quickly get things done at scale with larger teams. But one of the syntactic elements is a short declaration operator. And if you look at that operator, it looks a little bit like a gopher. That or the punisher, <laughs> right? And, uh, and so uh, you could do that. And my name is Todd McLeod. And, uh, um, and then I could add 
uh, that right there. And so uh, maybe one of the reasons uh, it became Go is because of that element, or maybe that element became that because of Go. I'll also Go Google first two letters, and also Go the connotation of speed, right? I think those are all also reasons that played, played into the naming of it. So, you know, there's great, uh, great, uh, great, um, great cryptography packages. There's great, you know, basically people ask me sometimes, well, what's Go good for? I and mean, it's like, it's good for whatever Google does. Like, you know, Google's rewriting Google and Go. Like, YouTube is all Go. That, that, that's pretty amazing. And, uh, and so here, you know, um, gRPC, remote procedure calls or scraping Twitter. We just released that class like two days ago. And, uh, and then, you know, uh, this is a, you know, a, one, a course we did on um, uh, web architecture. And so that's gonna be coming out soon. <clears throat> and uh, there's already an introductory to web development, introductory to language course that I have here on Udemy. So um, Go is good for, you know, what Google does and you could dig through all of this is sort of, uh, all of this, I gotta find where that, there's that, don't need that anymore, don't need that anymore, don't need that anymore, don't need that anymore, don't need that, this is what I need. Um, you know, here's all of the standard library, so you could really quickly drop into the standard library and you could take a look. And it's, it's a beautiful language, you know, like even from my background, which isn't academically trained in computer science, I could appreciate the engineering of, of this just when I see what it's capable of doing, like automatically creating documentation and automatically formatting your code and all of these different elements that are built into it. When I see it, I'm like, wow, this is really well thought through and really well built. And so here's a standard library. There's one other website which is good to know about, and that's godoc.org. And so I gave you golang.org, and I am going to... Uh, I guess, no, I'm just going to keep sticking with what I said. Uh, I'm going to put godoc.org right there. And so godoc.org is, uh, is a standard library and third-party packages, right? So you could search there for third-party packages and, uh, you know, find things that other people have written uh, to allow you to uh, do whatever it is you need to do. Like maybe I needed a UUID. And so I could search in there, or you know, you could see some of the popular ones right there. But there's a UUID if I need a UUID. Um, so that's a that's a little bit about you know the resources that you need, and we're done with that one. And uh, okay, so now let's uh, see this run. So if I go to my terminal and I'm uh, here, let me switch that over a little bit. and go run main.go. <clears throat> Hello world, I'm Todd McLeod. And, uh, and if I wanted to, uh, now I could create a type, and you could create your own types. So hot dog int, and you know, like what? You have a type hot dog? Oh yeah, question, go for it. How did you get the space out So uh, when you go and you look at the documentation, thank you, um, and uh, if I, I always just go to godoc.org and you could forward slash right there to the thumped package. So if you know the, the route, and you can see the imports will match that. So I'm importing Fumped, right? And here at Godoc, you know, I'm looking at Fumped. It's just, you know, the route. And so when I look at, like, the index here, I have Fumped print line. And then if I read about print line, print line formats using, so it's a C family language. You know, Rob and Pike and Ken Thompson helped build B and C. So it's heavily influenced by B and C and Unix and piping and, uh, you know, so, uh, but here it says, uh, spaces are always added between operands and a new line is appended. <laughs> so you just become familiar with, like, what's the function say, and, yes? Aside from what Google may be using this for internally, what are the top uses out in either industry or open source? Yeah. Right so I'm not sure what, you know, like, I don't have a ranking of them, um, but uh, let me see if, uh, I have a little slide that says what it's, I do somewhere. Um, you know, but web, you know, so basically the short answer, that's what I already said, which is like great for what Google does. And um, uh, um, here we go. Uh, web apps, network servers, mobile applications. The, so mobile applications are really good for low level, you know, low level programming. 
um, and not using, like Java has the standard library already for doing Android stuff, and, um, or their library, right? But, uh, but this would be like great if you just want something to compile and run right on the architecture, uh, the hardware. Um, that's where you'd use it. Machine learning, image processing, obviously it's not as robust as Python. Python's the dominant in machine learning, but there's machine learning stuff. Image processing, load balancers, system admin, uh, hardware scripts, crypto. And uh, I taught a course for Linda, which was uh, uh, a lot of work. <laughs> and, um, and it didn't turn out as well. Like high pressure si situations, um, like at Linda, I kind of crunched a little bit. I was outside my comfort zone. Um, but uh, um, uh, also I did a thing in New York over the summer where, where I crunched a little bit. But this, this, if you just kind of like drop in, like this has a really great solution for um, for image processing. I don't want to sign in with LinkedIn. Uh, so, so uh, you know, you could check that out. But those are some of them. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, it used to be really difficult to have an IDE that worked well. And so my two recommendations in order of preference is VS Code because it's free. And it's robust, and that's what I'm using right now, and it works really well. And then if you want something that's more full functionality, I recommend JetBrains has something called uh, GoLand. And uh, they used to call this GogLand, and then somebody at JetBrains emailed me, and they said the CEO is watching one of your YouTube videos and heard you uh, lamenting about how it's called GogLand, and he changed the name to GoLand. So he changed the name to GoLand because one of my YouTube videos, <laughs> which I think is a crack up. Um, I asked the CEO if he wanted to have lunch, but he never got back to me. <laughs> I said, hey, I'll fly over. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, so let's see, see uh, creating types. So you could create whatever type you want, like type hot dog int, and then I could do uh, var y hot dog equal 42, and then I could come down here and I could say fump, and I told you it's like the next step in evolution of programming. And I could say, what is the type of hot dog? And so y is a variable of type hot dog, percent %t, backslash new line. And, uh, and I could also just print out uh, what the value is of hot dog. And uh, so if I run that, and I got some cool things to say. A lot of people get tripped up. But you can see that that type is hot dog and declare it in package main. And the value is 42. Well, why would you want to do that? Because then you could start to do things like type person struct. And so you have basic data types, and you have aggregate composite data types, and Go really leans on composition. And so if you go and look at Bill Kennedy's blog, and uh, he's got a great blog, so uh, I'm just going to put that in. He has like a, a series of entries on composition as a design pattern. But you could, you know, you have basic data types, and you have aggregate or composite data types that compose together, aggregate together a lot of values of different, different types. And so I could do uh, first is a string. And then whatever other fields I wanted to add in here, so maybe I also want that to be last, last is a string. Um, and maybe I wanted age or date of birth or whatever. And then I could also do type secret agent. And a type secret agent is gonna be, the underlying type will be a struct and it's gonna, you could embed a type in another type, one struct in another struct. So I'm gonna embed a person in type secret agent. So secret agent will be everything a person is but uh, they will also have some other things like maybe a license to kill and that will be a true or a false. And so now I could come down here and I'm just going to uh, commit this code. Um, I'm just wondering how to do that so, uh, so that you have this uh, set stuff before I delete things, dash M and uh, starting uh, examples and uh, get push. and uh, get uh, tag v0.1.0 and get push dash dash tags. So uh, now when you go to the GitHub repo, um, you should be able to GitHub, is it already up? Uh, oh, where is it? Oh, there it is, thank you. My eyes ain't what they used to be. And so you could click on this little thing right here, and then you could click on tags, and you could go to any point in this talk, right, whatever that is. So you could see the code at different points, if that's new to you. Um, and so uh, now I've got that, and I could create, uh, you know, person one, 
uh, colon equal is going to be, and this is called a composite literal, and so it's a design pattern. Once you wrap your head around this design pattern, it gets you like 98% of the way to writing go, but you, it's gonna be the type, and then curly braces, and then values. And so uh, just to follow that design pattern, and I'll duplicate that line, and just comment that out so you have it. Um, and that's known as a composite literal, so I'll add that in, uh, composite composite literal, and so now, uh, to do that, just filling in the formula here, I'm going to do type person, and type person, I'm going to put in the values, and first is going to be Jenny, and uh, last will be uh, Money Penny, and uh, we don't talk, every language, every culture has its own language, every subculture has its own language, if you go hang out with surfers, they'll say, man, that thing was totally peaking and A-framing, and then firing down the line, you're like, what are you talking about? Every subculture has its own language. So the same in programming, every language has a language with which you talk about the language. And so uh, the creators of Go were really explicit in the words that they chose to discuss things. They're very precise. And so the precision is they don't talk about public-private. They talk about visible, not visible, exported, not exported. And so if I wanted to have something be visible outside this package, like maybe I want to take all this and uh, you know, send it, marshal it to JSON, uh, I would need those to be capitalized. And then capitalization determines whether or not you know, something's exported, visible outside of a package, or whether it's private, not exported to that package. But I'm going to leave those lowercase just because I've already got it lowercase down below. And so there's a... a uh, person, uh, P1, and then I could flump dot print line P1. And an unused variable is an error. And so you have to, you have to, um, you have to use your variables, otherwise that's an error. You can't have extraneous things sitting around. And then I could do P2, colon equals, uh, person, and, uh, and this one could be, uh, this one will do secret agent, actually. I want to kind of demonstrate that. Secret agent, and secret agent is going to be everything a person is, right? And then we're also going to have license to kill, which will be true, because this will be James Bond. And now I need to fill this one out. But right there, you kind of get a real clear picture of, like, person, person, and, um, hi, mom. <laughs> it's my mom. I'm going to hang up on her. I'll call her back. Um, so that's a person, a person two, and then I just need to fill it out, and I fill it out the same way here. And sec, oh, last, first, second is a bond. And, uh, and then I could print out uh, P2. And so if I run this, whoops. You know. That's cool. And then uh, Go also really leans on uh, interfaces. And so interfaces allow you to do a lot of really cool things like polymorphism. It's a big phrase. And uh, it's just another layer of abstra abstraction and, um, and allow more code reusability. So you could define interfaces. So an interfaces are implicitly implemented and um, and, and you know, so you, one value could be of many types. So in Go, we really talk about, in Go, we really talk about, in Go, we really talk about and think about a value being of certain types. And all values are actually of one or more, uh, two or more types. All values are actually of two or more types. Like I said, interesting, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, just real quickly to show you interfaces, I could attach methods to these functions. And I do that with something called a receiver. So the signature of her function is going to be the funk keyword and then a receiver. And the receiver is just like a parameter, but it sits in front of the identifier, the name of the function. And then you're going to have your parameters and uh, parameters. And then you're going to have your returns. And those uh, are optional. So if I was doing like, you know, um, some Bacchus BNF kind of thing, right? But uh, multiple returns, you need the prints around, around them, but one you don't. 
and then you're going to have your code. And so just to show you what that looks like, we could have func, and, uh, and this will be attached type person, and it will be uh, speak, and uh, speak will not take anything in nor return anything. Let's do func.println, and we'll say p. Dot, we'll say I am a person named robot. I am a person named p. Dot, uh, first, comma, p. Dot, last. And, uh, and then I could copy this. Oops. Hopefully I copied that. I did not. I could copy that and I could attach this to, uh, uh, what did I call it, secret agent. And uh, SA. And so now, now they both have a function called speak. And, um, and then I could also uh, create a, a, a type uh, human interface. And a human is any, any value that has the, any type that has any, any type that has the method speak. And so now anything that's going to be of type person will also be type human. Anything that's type secret agent is also type human because they each have the method speak and that's how I'm defining the interface. Which one? The person in the... Oh, 17? Yeah. No, you just put it in straight like that. You don't do like person, person. And uh, I'm sure there was a debate about that when they were creating the language, but you just drop this, the struct in. And then if you highlight it, it'll be like, boom, takes you to that if you click on it, right? So, uh, and then I could create a function. I could say func uh, foo is going to take in a human. And uh, what func foo will do is it will do func.println and it'll uh, call, uh, well, what's, we don't need a print line. It will just call speak for each human, and because that method is attached to every human by definition. And so down here, right, I can now, I can now say, um, so that function is called foo. I could say foo, and I could pass in uh, value p1, which, by the way, is type person. And I could do foo, and I could pass in value, uh, uh, value p2, which is of type secret agent. And for person, it's going to call the speak function connected to person uh, right here. And for, you know, um, secret agent, it's going to call the function secret agent uh, right here, the speak function. And if I wanted to, I could even drill down. Oops, I could even drill down for a piece person two. I could say person two uh, type person speak if I wanted to get really sp specific um, when calling that. I'm not quite sure how I'd do that right there, but let's see it run. So that's like a little bit of polymorphism. And I'm going to uh, just commit this code, and then I want to show you uh, one more thing. Um, uh, a composition. And then get push. <laughs> and yeah, go for it. What's your question? Can you look at uh, the line 26 you code and explain what you Sure. Uh, what did I forget to do? Get tag. Is that right? Oh, let's get push tag. Uh, let's see, I'll just do get push tag. I'll switch. Tags just throw me off. All right, and so uh, you want to see the code at what line? Yeah. Yeah, so any value. Yeah, so any value, uh, any type that has the method speak will also be type human, implicitly implemented, so you don't have to go back and change stuff. Well, uh, yeah, this stuff here. So uh, those could be completely different implementations, and they would <laughs> they would be different. Uh, you know, like um, 
you know, depending upon what you need to do. So if you're, you know, like uh, IO Writer is, uh, is one of the most common popular Godoc forward slash IO, right? And to implement the writer interface, which is right here, type writer, you need to have this method. And so if you're writing to standard out or writing to a file, you know, for a file to implement that method, it will have, this is how you write to a file, and it'll have its own implementation. And if you're writing to the web, a server is going to have its own implementation of that. But when I write code, I could say, hey, my response, I could either send it to the client or I could write it to a file. Because both of them take a writer, and my response knows how to write to a writer. And the implementation of writes is going to be really different for a file than to the web, right? But because, you know, so this is just uh, uh, what my friend Daniel calls... Um, what does he call it? I don't know, just like uh, uh, kid code or, uh, you know, it's just like for an example. I guess what I'm saying is um, secret agents make a person in it, so is there no way to just delegate to the person inside it instead of having to copy and repeat the thing? And in theory, if I change how a person speaks, then maybe secret agents can make it uh, I don't totally understand the question. Maybe we could talk about it afterwards. Um, last thing I'll show you is just... Uh, you know, working with pointers, I think, is a good thing. Um, and, uh, and then maybe we got like seven minutes. We'll see how far we could get. And so um, if I have a value, x colon equal 42, and uh, I could fump dot print line, um, um, x colon equal, yeah, let me just do that. Front, front, uh, print line the value, but then I could also print line the address where that value is stored in memory. And so that gives me a pointer. And so if I run this code now, did it again. There we go. Um, so the value 42 is stored at that address in memory. And, uh, and if I look at the types of those, um, I guess I'll do it like this. So format printing and then see the type, percent %t and then backslash n for a new character and then comma and duplicate that. And I want to see the type of x and I want to see the type of address of x. So uh, the value of x is an int. The type of, sorry, the value is 42. The type is int. And then the, the value of x uh, ampersand x, taking the address of x, is that's the value, and the type is pointer to an int. It's pointer to an int. So everything in Go is passed by value. If I'm passing in a value, I'm passing in a certain type into a function, and then what's the function do, right? The function's going to copy that to the parameter value, and then use that in the function, but whatever I'm passing in is passing in. So forget, like, pass by value, pass by reference, like, just, you know, it's just all clear exactly what you're doing. If you're passing in an int to a function, you're passing in an int. If you're passing in an address, you're passing in an address. And so and then you could dereference an address. And so dereferencing an address uh, looks like this. And it's uh, an operator. So that's different than this star here, which is part of the type. That star is an operator. And so when I do that, When I do that, I'm going to get the value back, 42. And so, you know, the way you could use that in um, a function would be, you know, func foo takes n and int, and, uh, and then just, you know, n is equal to 43, and that's it, and I guess maybe print, print it, and uh, inside foo, and uh, so I will pass in, um, so I'm going to commit all this. SM, more, get push, get tag v0, 3, 0, is that right? I don't remember. <laughs> Two, yeah. All right. 
Um, so if I have that, I could call through and I could pass in an int, and then I could print out print line uh, back in main, and I could print that. And uh, when I run this, inside foo it's 43, back in main it's 42. However, if I say, hey, this is going to take in a pointer to an int, and if I pass in the address, and then here I'm going to say at this value, which is an address, dereference it and work with the value there. So I dereference it. Uh, now I'm changing the value at that address. And now when I run this, and maybe just to make it a little bit more clear, I could dereference that, right? Or I could just see what the value is. What's up? Yeah, so error handling is a big part of Go, and uh, they, they, they basically have said to us from down on high, programmers have not done a good enough job handling errors, and so they are very, uh, um, exp you have to be really explicit in handling errors, and so a common error is a nil pointer dereference, and so there are, you know, data types with their structures are automatically references, and... Um, Near, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so if you do a nil pointer dereference, your program stops running. Yeah. Yeah, it's compiled. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we got two minutes left. Um, any, you know, it's not really enough time to do anything more. So any more questions? So what's that one here? How do you debug? So um, uh, we have, uh, you know, debugging right in your editor. So you could do debugging right in your editor, or you're handling errors and you pass errors up. And there's, um, you know, through a call stack, you have a way to say if this errors, pass that up and keep wrapping the errors, and you're able to unwrap the errors. And so there's an entire package for doing that, and that's godoc.org forward slash errors. And, uh, and so here, you know, are the four functions in there. And then you also use uh, godoc.org forward slash fumpt. And you use uh, error, fumpt error f, which creates a value of type error. And, uh, you know, and uh, makes it an error, returns an error. And if you look at what an error is, that's from package built in. It's just a built in type and it's an interface with this method. And so you could create your own errors, right? So you have a lot of flexibility. Next question I saw was over here, I think, and then there, and then there. Was there another one there? No? Okay, he's gone on. Yeah, so the course we just released um, right here uh, is great. Todd McLeod, Udemy. And uh, there's not a lot of, there's, I haven't found anything else out there. Um, Todd McLeod right here. And uh, in this course right here, we have, you know, it's 11 hours, and a third of the course is all about modules. Yeah. So look for those little gophers. Other question? Uh, data overflow. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's never come up. I don't have an answer for that. If anybody has an answer for data overflow, talk to DGDB hat up here. It compiles straight to an executable that runs on whatever architecture you compile it to. I could write on a Mac. I could compile it for Windows. I could compile it for Linux. I could compile it for Mac. So it's yeah, yeah. So. So Bill Kennedy worked in C++, I believe. And... Uh, you know, uh, one of the guys who works with me used to work in Python. And so interestingly, the creator of Python left Python for Go. Yeah, back in the back. Say that again? Oh, so um, I don't, and, uh, and I, I think I, would, uh, I have been hearing good things about Vue and leaning towards Vue. But, um, 
you know, every, we did Greater Commons just kind of uh, hand rolled, just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Yeah. So if you're working in a team environment and you've got certain people compiling certain files, what format of, is it like an equivalent of JavaScript? So if you're working in a machine language and what? Wait, say your question again. Like with C++, you can generate a .o file from a C++ yeah. file, and then you can link those together. So, um, like have a similar yeah, so in the compilation process, and this is all happened by, happens by the compiler, um, you know, traditionally, before modules, you had um, a workspace, and the workspace had three folders, a folder for your source code, and then a folder for your binaries that were all compiled. And then they had something else called packages. And so when it compiles, it will compile your packages and it compiles all those into separate little, like this is compiled, that's compiled, that's compiled, now let's put it all together. And so you might have a thousand packages and then you go change one package. It doesn't need to recompile all those 999 other packages. It just does the one you change and then gets the compilations it's already did for those other ones and brings it all together. And that's my understanding. And, uh, and so I don't know if that speaks. I never, like I said, man, I'm econ business, and I never worked in C++, but that's my understanding of it. So um, do you know, like, like, what's the contact value model your plan to use? Like, uh, is it a Go routine? And my thought is that we have a factory expansion that we can maybe, like, put a factory on somewhere like that. I'm, ha I've, I'm having a little trouble hearing. So what's the... CSP, Tony, Tony Hoare, uh, 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 sequential processes, concurrent sequential processes is modeled after his work. And, and Tony and Rob, I think, were friends, acquaintances, if not friends. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I get why uh, Kubernetes is written in Go, obviously, Google, but why Docker also? I, I don't, you know, I mean, it's awesome. It's the best language you could be working in today. It's, it's efficient execution. It's, you know, efficient compilation, it's ease of programming, and it's got a super cool community. So I think they just said, of course. I don't know. I don't know why. From a security standpoint, too, any advantages of Go running in Go? Yeah, so Go is uh, super security conscious, and they prevent you from doing things uh, unbeknownst to yourself. And so, for instance, if you look at, like, um, web stuff, and I'll talk about web, web at 5 o'clock, but uh, they have a text template package, and then uh, HTML template package, which you know does all the escaping to prevent injection and cross-site scripting and stuff like that. And then also um, there was something recently, just the last week, I was doing, and you know, like in the encryption package, you know, the functions are written to have constant time, so you can't hack it based upon how long is it taking to compute success versus failure as you, you know, are, are hashing um, a comparison or doing a comparison. So that stuff, it's really security conscious. Yeah. 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 So uh, Go is hugely demanded in industry, and there isn't a ton of Go programmers right now. So supply and demand marketplace. I recently had somebody go through two of my courses, and they went from $25 an hour as a SQL programmer to $150,000 a year building Pizza Hut's back end. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, two classes, and the guy, you know, tripled his salary. Um, and so it's up and coming. It continues to gain more momentum. In 2015, you know, uh, it was still kind of a risky thing. Should I go with it? But now it's, uh, you know, widely acknowledged and credentialed and adopted. And, and you know, um, so I think it's up and coming. And obviously, there's always going to be a place for Java programmers, for uh, Python programmers, for JavaScript programmers. Those languages have nuances and do things that are like, you know, Python for... Um, uh, machine learning, right? But um, uh, I think Go is the up and coming, and I like what Bill Gates says, if you want to be successful, get in front of what's coming and let it hit you. And so I think, you know, I mean, you can make a good argument for a career in any of those languages. COBOL I wouldn't recommend, but, you know, and I think it's just a nice community and it's a fun language and it's easy to write. 
Huh? Data science, data science Python. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Um, I'm not informed enough to say what's the most popular in data science. Does anybody know for data science what's the most popular language? Yeah, I've heard R too. Well, not Hack it together. <laughs> all right. Well, it was a pleasure having you all here. Does anybody have any more questions? If you do, you could just find me. I'm around for what till five, and then there'll be a web presentation at five. And uh, thank you for coming. I hope this has been useful. And if you have any questions, the last resource I'll give you is uh, my Twitter and then also my uh, email. And so I'll put those in this note here. Okay, thanks for coming. Have a great day, y'all.